Hello and welcome. So here we are in lecture 14. Uh, and as promised, today we're talking about inheritance. It's kind of this big catch-all term for a lot of things, right? But the big picture course we're talking about today is yet another form of reuse, right? How can we figure out ways to make our design processes more efficient and more productive by reusing things we've already built, other things that people have already built, and how to kind of design our whole system, how to do that. So uh, let's get into it. So as I said, there's, there's, there's a lot to this, right? Um, so today is really kind of just uh, a simple introduction or kind of taster of what's there. And hopefully it'll put some things in the back of your mind that you'll kind of consider when you're doing larger projects. They'll be, mm, maybe we should look into this future. Mm, maybe we should think about this other consideration uh, that might help you think about this, right? Because there's kind of multiple things going on here. There's all of the complexity uh, possible with what is known in the PL community about what you can do with object-oriented inheritance. And there's, there's a lot. There is what's available in Scala, which is a lot. There is um, what is good software engineering practices and uses of these features. Also substantial, you know, that could be an entire course on its own. And then there is us trying to do this in Chisel, right? So there's like four different concepts here, right? And so we're going to kind of <laughs> distill it down to kind of the key points. Um, you may not use every feature covered today and it's fullest feature in all of your projects, right? But you'll kind of see the thing. Remember to kind of... In the end of the day, kind of the internal monologue you should have isn't just, isn't this neat, but how might I use this, right? How might this help me be more productive? How might I be make this easier for me to package up what I'm working on so it's easier for someone else to reuse it, right? That should be kind of the main narrative you should kind of ask yourself in the back of your head about this sort of stuff. So as you can see, I'm talking about, you know, inheritance available inside the Scala language, how we use it with Chisel, and we'll conclude uh, with the type penetration parameterization. If you remember from last lecture where we made our own queue and we showed design progression, we kind of kept making it more and more flexible. By the end, we had a pretty good queue, but the issue was it only could do uints, right? And we'd like to do perhaps arbitrary types. That'll be our finale for today. So uh, let's go ahead and load in uh, our chisel stuff. And then let's talk about door inheritance, right? So I said, the goal here is reuse, right? That, you know, the entire thing we talk about with agile programming is being very you know, nimble, responsive, and kind of iteratively improving. But the, the end goal also, of course, is to have less effort expended. And reuse, that is using things that already exist, is the best way to save effort. Now, the typical challenge with reuse is that the thing that exists is it do exactly what I need to do, right? It may not do quite the same thing. And if it's too different from what you need, then perhaps, and it's too brittle, too hard to modify, perhaps you're kind of in trouble, right? But the thing we been covering all quarter in this class is, you know, if we have a parameterized hardware generator, that generation capability gives enough flexibility that perhaps that thing is usable in more cases, and thus perhaps we more able to reuse it. So it's kind of all about generators, right? Now, inheritance is another model of reuse, right? Where it's not so much I'm taking this whole thing as a lump sum as is. Instead, it's more kind of a a la carte model, where I'm maybe going to take some things here and there and look in particular for opportunities to have overlap between similar things, right? So our generator idea is, hey, you need somebody that does X, here's a generator, it's gonna produce uh, somebody that does X. With inheritance, you're gonna see, you know what? Uh, what if I'm making multiple modules to do things like doing X? Uh, do I need to write H1 from scratch? Or perhaps could I, you know, write things in a way where I can share implementations or interfaces in a way? And that's what we're talking about, right? So in particular, we're using inheritance in both for those two cases, right? Talking about both not only the components as the functionality, but also sometimes even just for interfaces, right? Just making sure that things kind of match up in a way it's kind of easy to express, right? And um, we'll see this kind of play out in a few different examples. Uh, and that's kind of the point where we're doing it. So the whole point, number one, is, you know, they get reuse. And with inheritance, talking about reuse between things that are similar. Um, and as I said, there's going to be a lot of wrinkles to... Uh, Scala's uh, object-oriented capabilities for inheritance. There's all sorts of things. Uh, if you get a little confused about, you know, which mechanism to use, that's fine. <laughs> uh, we can ask questions, talk about it over and over again, research it again on the web, th this happens. Um, as I said, so Scala's got a lot of these functions, a lot of functionality here, and so we're only kind of scratching the surface. Um, so the first example of inheritance uh, is doing simple, you know, inheriting from a class. You know, I have a class and I'm making another class that's going to extend that class, right? So what does that mean? Well, when I extend the class, I get everything the original class has, and then I can go ahead and add new things to it. 
or I can override those things specifically over, you know, uh, change the functionality, right? Uh, and so uh, you can see here, for example, okay, we you know define the parent class. Uh, and what does it do? Uh, well, it has a name, takes some sort of phrase, and we say, hey, you know, you can uh, have this greet functionality. So maybe I'll go ahead and comment out the bottom part for now. And we run this, and you know, okay, yes. Uh, we instantiated a parent called Kate, and we asked it to greet, and you know, combine these things together and said, hello, Kate. Great. Now, um, with this child class, uh, we're extending parent, i.e. we're inheriting from parent. Uh, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to choose to override the phrase, right? So uh, maybe in this case, we'll say hola, right, instead of hello, right? So uh, for the child, okay, we'll go ahead and instantiate it. And as you can see, of course, has kind of the uh, behavior we expected, right? So what do we do here? Well, uh, this is a really trivial small example, so perhaps it may not convey all the benefit, but you can see that in this case, right, we define a new class that behaves differently than the original class. Uh, however, it's able to reuse some functionality, right? So we're actually reusing the same greet method. And this greet method is looking at an internal part of the core, a class, right? And so for parents to set the phrase and we overwrote it in the child. Oops, this is a, a typo. I'm gonna fix that before I forget. Um, and we have that set up, right? So here's an example where we have a class it does what something we like, and perhaps we want to do something else with a little bit more functionality, or a little bit different functionality. We can go ahead and override that. So it's like a very, you know, straightforward standard use of uh, inheritance. Now, one thing I'll point out: this is going to come a question come up later on, but maybe we'll answer it right now. Uh, in Scala, with the simple inheritance that we're describing right here, you can only inherit from one class, right? So some languages have this ability of having multiple inheriting from multiple classes. Um, this becomes uh, a little thorny of an issue. Uh, there's some potential dragons there, so to speak, uh, in terms of uh, knowing which implementations of things to use or which or what order to even check which classes where things come from. It gets a little tricky. So I'm not going to go into details for that for now, but suffice to say, this is a uh, language design choice that Scala made to keep things understandable. Uh, I think it's a reasonable choice. Uh, if you want to do multiple classes uh, of inheritance, we'll cover that later. Uh, you use something called a trait, which is, I think, a good compromise. Um, but for now, it's a single class uh, inheritance case. I'll be able to pause if there's any questions so far. Um, so, you know, here we're doing things in Scala world. We're going to do one more example of Scala before we move back to, to Chisel. Uh, so what if you want to do an abstract class, right? So uh, an abstract class is, you know, constantly you've learned in the course about Java or whatever, right? is something that uh, defines a class, but you can't actually instantiate it. That's why it's abstract. Um, and my Zoom just cut out, so I'm gonna keep talking for the recording. However, I'm hoping the Zoom reconnects. Oops, okay, I'm gonna still uh, try to recover the Zoom, because that's obviously gonna be important. So yeah, the, uh... hello, yes, I think I had a network connectivity issue. Uh, the recording has me staring at my screen frustratedly, but I think I'm ready to uh, reshare and we'll continue. So uh, can someone enlighten me what the last thing I talked about was? Was I still talking about the uh, single class inheritance? Did you guys see me transition to this slide? Okay, so yeah, so I was mid-transition. Okay, so we were talking about, uh, you know, here's a simple straightforward inheritance. Now what about using uh, inheriting from an abstract class? So you have this notion of an abstract class where we're gonna kind of define the behavior for a class, you know, the, the, sorry, the, the, what the class is gonna be. However, by rule, when it's abstract, you're saying, I can't instantiate it. Uh, and so if you actually want to use that class, you need to subclass it, then inherit it from it, 
and then you can use it in the instantiations. However, by having all the instantiations share, or in, sorry, should inherit from these uh, this abstract you know parent class, uh, you have a single way of defining the original things, and they can have that type kind of passed around, and they're all kind of interoperate. So, uh, as you can see, for example, we kind of have our prior thing, but I tweaked it a little bit. So uh, now let's say we have a still our abstract class parent. Uh, remember before we kind of defaulted with this very English centric notion of, oh yeah, it's going to say greeting hello. That's very English centric. Why not say uh, that's some sort of you know phrase to greet people? And then we'll go ahead and make subclasses that actually uh, are you know per language, right? So here we have you know in English or in Spanish, and we have the same functionality as the, the prior slide. Um, and so the couple of small details to kind of really uh, emphasize, you know, is by going to an abstract class, it's as simple as just saying this is abstract. What's cool about an abstract class is you can leave some members abstract that is uh, defined but not implemented, and that's totally okay. So for example, here we have a val. Don't give it an actual value, right? And here we looks like we're almost like we're reassigning that val, right? Um, but here what we're doing is we're you know defining the fact that there's gonna be this val. It's abstract, and then here we are making it concrete, right? So that's that's totally okay. Remember in the prior slide, uh, if we go back, uh, you know we did not use abstract, and um, when there was something in the parent class, and we specifically wanted to change it rather than just add something in addition to it. We had to use this override keyword to let it know. For example, if I remove this override keyword, it's going to complain that val uh, already exists, right? So, uh, yeah, because it was you know a concrete thing, I needed override to uh, you know override it, as you know the name would imply. Uh, here it's abstract, so I don't need to give it that concrete thing. But otherwise, it's the same. And you know, perhaps maybe this is a nice, uh, more congruent way of thing you're talking about things and say, oh yeah, you know, we have this parent abstract class, and it's going to greet people, and you know you can have subclasses actually are per language, right? It's kind of a much nicer organization about how to kind of set things up. And as I said before, we'll come to this at the very end. There's this notion of what's called a trait, uh, which um, uh, can help you do multiple inheritance, which is nice. Uh, the reason why uh, I didn't lead off of traits is there are some cases where you might want to after a class instead of a trait. Like I said, with Scala, it's like all these different functions and there's a reason why they exist. Um, in particular, with the chisel stuff, uh, we use abstract classes perhaps more than many other Scala users. And the key feature is that with an abstract class, you're allowed to uh, still take constructor parameters. So a class, you, you can have constructor parameters. With an abstract class, you can also have constructor parameters. So you can see, for example, here in the subclass, right? I took a parameter for this class thing and just passed that variable, you know, sorry, that uh, value straight on to the parent constructor, right? And so yeah, so that uh, you know gets passed over, uh, no problem. Um, with a trait, meanwhile, you cannot have constructor parameters. So that's one of the limitations of traits. And the reason why the limitation is put in place is kind of related to this whole issue of why you don't normally want multiple inheritance. So it's a little bit thorny. Um, but yeah, so for us, you know, like I said, perhaps already starting to get drowned in functionalities in Scala, the question should be. Uh, what am I trying to do, right? What code or what interfaces am I trying to reuse between multiple things? If there's only ever going to be one class and only ever one instance, uh, you know, or let's just stay with only one class, you maybe you don't need to worry about inheritance too much, right? You might still want to use traits later on for something called mixins. We'll come to at the very end, but really for us as someone you know designing a new world, uh, you know, we're going to consider inheritance really kind of a way to get nice reuse between things that are similar. Uh, in this case, the reuse, you know, is that we want to have this greet method and it's kind of this general structure of, you know, using this phrase to greet a name. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, uh, you know, uh, how we package it together. So, uh, you know, perhaps with the abstract class is a little bit more tidy. Uh, questions so far? Okay. So then... Um, you can imagine there's all sorts of things you can uh, inherit and extend. And so as a good example of how this kind of played out, we can look at how they did it with Scala. So as I kind of have said before, 
we keep using seek all over the place. I like using seek all over the place, but actually it's not a concrete class. Um, and so you, when you actually run the command on the command line, you know, in the, in the Jupyter or in a in REPL, you typically get back, you know, like a list or a vector, depending on what you're doing, right? And those are concrete classes. So in this diagram, the gray boxes are concrete classes you actually can instantiate. instantiate. Uh, the blue boxes, uh, I believe, actually are not so much abstract classes actually as they actually are traits, I'm pretty sure. And then uh, the legend, you can look at this webpage, you can look it up, you can figure out what different error types mean in terms of how things are inherited. Uh, you know, what, what style inheritance is using. But you can still see, for example, kind of the similarities, right? So for example, seek, that collection of kind of use to kind of handle our things together. There's so many different things kind of put in there. So they kind of decided to taxonomize those into two different groups, right? So for example, uh, a linear seek versus an indexed seek, right? So um, as you might suggest, you know, an index seek takes an index as a numerical position argument versus a linear seek you kind of need to go through, um, uh, you know, by, by element, one by one, and you can kind of see, oh yeah, so you know, a list, you know, like a linked list, you know, a stack, okay, it's a different order of how you put things in there. Uh, you know, a stream has, you know, certain papers not gonna cover in this course, but these things are all similar and they kind of implement the same API as a linear seek, right? And so there's some functionality that's specific to a linear seek, which is an extension of functionality that's in seek, which is an extension of functionality, which is in iterable, which is also, you know, uh, not concrete, which extension functionality is reversible, right? So you kind of think about it. the simplest thing is something that just is some sort of thing. It doesn't need to be a collection. It could just be like a range being created on the fly that, you know, is something that's traversable, right? Okay, then if it's traversable, then it's iterable. So you can kind of see how you build together these abstractions. So in this case, you know, this is something they spent a lot of time designing for the Scala creators where they're thinking about all the functionalities needed with certain data structures. And you can see this, this, this uh, taxonomy here is a range not only between different um, APIs, but also different implementations, right? So for example, uh, you know, whether you want to use uh, like a vector uh, or, or some of the other things, and maybe a difference between different types of set, uh, like performance needs, for example. Um, and you can see, for example, you know, the seek is, you know, a different uh, set of functionality available to it than you might have in a set, for example, or in a map. So, uh, oh, and for those who are not familiar, uh, this is an annoyance I have. They use the term map with a capital M to refer to a mapping data structure that is what you might think of in other uh, languages. It's something kind of like, uh, like a content uh, address uh, thing, kind of like, you know, uh, a hash table or something. So you can see, of course, there's a hash map uh, as one of the concrete instantiations of a map basically takes, you know, something through a mapping function and you get something else out of it, right? And so it's a data structure where you, rather than being constrained to have your numeric indices like an index seek, you can have arbitrary things be your addressing, whether it be strings, whatnot. Um, that's not normally used for hardware, but you might use that uh, for um, uh, passing around parameters and that sort of thing in your larger generator library. And as the TA points out, uh, another analogy you can think of, this is very similar to like a dict in Python. Yes, exactly like that, it's a dictionary in Python. Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of the point. So you can, I'm more showing this slide here to kind of give you a sense of, you start thinking about when you start building related things, right? In this case, you're building a bunch of collections. Could you imagine if this didn't exist? Instead, you had the list implementation was a completely self-standing, independent class. It's a lot of code to write. And wouldn't it be annoying if you, after writing that list class, you also had to write the stack class from scratch? No, what you're gonna do is you're probably gonna be tempted to go copy and paste some of the methods from your list class about, oh yes, I want that iterator interface. I want that blank interface or whatever. And guess what? If you start copying and pasting code, that should be, you know, uh, some sort of warning light flashing in your mind about uh, how do I avoid that, right? And so the way you avoid that is recognize what's the common thing you want between these. Maybe it's a functionality. Maybe it's an interface. Maybe it's a little bit of both, right? Maybe what you want to do is you want to say, hey, uh, you know, if I implement certain API functions, I can implement other API functions in terms of those, right? So in terms of these uh, traits here, which of these have implementations versus which of these are purely abstract, it, it may not be obvious from the outside, right? Uh, you may be able to implement some things in terms of other things, right? But yeah, big picture is just, like I said, the goal, goal for this thing is think about inheritance, thinking about reuse, and thinking about what kind of things you're gonna go after. Uh, in this case, you have a very, you know, clear type hierarchy. Um, there's a similar one I have at the end of the slides today for Chisel, but 
more so I just kind of want to show just, you know, put a little plot thought into how you kind of organize things. Cool. I'm going to keep pausing for questions. Okay, so then, uh, like I said, which for our goal for today is thinking about reuse, right? Um, so within Chisel, uh, we've been, you know, for Agile development, we want to reuse things. We've been doing different types of reuse, right? So our main vehicle, our main workhorse has been these parameterized generators, right? You know, you have some tasks, some problem you need solved, and, you know, hopefully you find a library of generators, generator solves the problem you need, and specialize it to your problem, you might give it, you know, the right parameters so it can specialize accordingly. That's kind of been our main hammer so far. And these generators, right, sometimes uh, they will return a, a full-on module. Sometimes they don't even return a module, right? Things like counter we saw, you know, is something that's not even a module. It's just like some chisel components you have to kind of instantiate inside of a module, right? But, you know, either way, we're trying to build something that's kind of reusable. Um, not to be overlooked, and this will become more apparent in some of the later assignments, uh, are bundles, right? So bundles aren't so much a module, it's just the interface. You can put a surprising amount of smarts in the bundle object, right? You can put some, uh, you know, helper methods and that sort of stuff. But also, uh, this seems, un, you, know, uh, you know, exciting. Recognize that a lot of times when you're writing um, RTL, you're oftentimes mostly defining interfaces, even with Chisel's conciseness. Uh, a surprising fraction of the lines, uh, you know, are related to interfaces. And if you look at a more traditional language like our uh, Verilog or System Verilog, you spend a lot of time defining interfaces, a lot of lines, and then a lot of lines connecting those interfaces, right? And so with bundles, there's actually are some pretty nice help with Chisel, right? Where we have this hierarchical construction where you can say, hey, you know what? Um, here's something we can kind of define as a bundle, and we can compose them, right? We have a bundle with bundles inside of it, and we use that in other places. Or we can define an interface in one place and instantiate in multiple places. That's really nice. Some of the more modern parts of System Verilog and DHL have some features. I'm aware of that. Um, but that's still kind of the same point, right? The whole point is, you know, trying to get reuse out of interfaces. And yeah, sometimes having a bundle you can just go ahead and uh, add on or compose into your current interface is really, really helpful. And then today, of course, we're talking about inheritance, right? So what can we do with this inheritance mechanism? Um, in particular, what we're looking for is what I'm saying, similar modules. So there's different types of modules you might call similar, and I'm putting some air quotes on those, right? Um, one could be modules that are really similar, like we saw, like, you know, those greeter module uh, objects from before, they're like really similar. Uh, yeah, they're like the small tweaks. Other times, the modules are actually quite different, but they wanna have a similar functionality for one aspect, right? Um, you know, you wanna have this one little thing about them that's kind of all the same. And so anywhere in between those things, or even those two extremes, uh, we're able to kind of do that, right? And so uh, the question is, you know, when you're kind of designing things is um, when should you use this functionality, right? So you could do things via inheritance. Sometimes for some cases, you can kind of get the func flexibility you need via uh, generators, right? And so, or you mix inheritance into your generators, right? So that's all possible. So it's a little bit of a design decision, we're kind of feeling it out. And the goal of today is actually to try and hopefully Expose you as possible with the inheritance, so that way you might consider it in some cases, right? Um, and so, as another example, which you know, be kind of amusing, as you know, you've been unusing inheritance uh, already <laughs> when you're writing Chisel, right? I kind of told you in the beginning of the course, oh yeah, you want to write a module, define a class, and then say extends module, or you want to write a bundle, you know, say extends bundle, and you guys did a great job treating that as boilerplate code and you know doing and forgetting about it, but you know now you know what's going on, right? Uh, it's uh, a way of us taking advantage of functionality in the Chisel language. Remember, Chisel isn't a proper language. It's a library inside of Scala masquerading as an embedded domain-specific language, right? And so uh, when you extend module, you know, you are inheriting things from that module into your class, and those things are going to help Chisel do its things behind the scenes, right? So when you, you know, instantiate a wire or a reg, it's able to kind of look in its enclosing uh, object, and then from there it's able to kind of get into the whole module ecosystem, so to speak, right? And so that's kind of what's going on behind the scenes. But so for you, you've already been doing it not knowing it. You've been extending module or extending bundle. Um, cool. Uh, so let's uh, do a simple uh, example. So what if we want to make uh, a uh, abstract class, let's say something we're kind of calling a unary operator, 
And what's it going to do? Well, we're going to parameterize our width because why not? Uh, we're going to extend module like we talked about. So there's our, there's our single choice of inheritance. We're going to define an operator, which is unary. So it takes one input, produces one output. Look at this, right? No specification, right? It's just, sorry, no implementation. It's just an abstract thing. It's just kind of saying it's going to be there. And so as a reminder, right, if you have an abstract class, anything without a implementation is abstract. So this is an abstract definition of function op. Sure, we defined it an IO, which we have, you know, an input and an output, and we connect the output to the result of this operation. So then if we want to go ahead and, uh, you know, actually make some concrete classes. You know, if we want to do a pass through, which basically does nothing, uh, we say, hey, given some uint, let's just give them that uint back. Okay. And how do we actually do all this? Well, you can see this right here where we uh, went ahead and, uh, you know, extended it and we passed the whips through because that's one nice thing about abstract classes. You can actually go ahead and pass uh, constructor parameters. And yeah, and because, uh, it was there. We, in this case, we overwrote it, but I think we actually can go ahead and remove that. And it's going to be just fine. Um, so we go ahead and run this. And so, yeah, here we have it as an abstract class. And we, I don't believe the override is necessary when it's abstract. No, it's not. But we also, um, uh, so yeah, so this is abstract. We don't necessarily need to have override. But uh, you might say the reason why we did that. Well, if I don't make it abstract, uh, I am going to need the overrides. But I'm also going to need to have a default implementation, right? So, right? Because it says, oh, wait, I didn't define that module. Now, arguably, pass through might not be a bad default behavior. Maybe that's something we want people to do explicitly. So, uh, you can see when I chose to write this uh, thing, I chose to do it uh, where it was abstract. So, you couldn't instantiate it, and you actually had to go ahead and specify that. But if there is a sensible default, that's a totally reasonable option to make it a concrete uh, class from the beginning. Um, and I guess we don't need to have the second thing here. Okay, and so then, you know, what if we wanted to do something else, right? If we want to make a negator, right? Okay, well, we say, hey, here's our negation mod, right? And, you know, we went ahead and put that in. So it's kind of cool is we're defining a function. Here's a concrete implementation. In the original abstract class, it was abstract. Even though the abstract class had an abstract implementation of op, it had a concrete implementation of the IO and of the how it's going to be used, the IO and the operation. And that was reused, right? So, uh, you know, you can imagine if I was even just this tiny example where I was trying to make these two modules, even just having to recopy the bundle over again, you'd already eat up a lot of those lines, right? And so this is already kind of a nice way to kind of simplify that down. So here's kind of a, you know, very first uh, use of reuse in Chisel. Let me all pause with any questions so far. Okay, well, let's keep going. So uh, what if we want to build something a little more sophisticated? So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build an abstract class with some things concretely implemented, uh, and then go ahead and uh, get a better, you know, reuse factor here, right? So here what we're doing is imagine maybe you want to build a collection of binary operators. I'm calling them decoupled operators because you can see they take in uh, decoupled inputs and two decoupled inputs is binary and then one decoupled uh, output. And internally, it's going to uh, um, not only perform the operation, which is done right here, uh, it's going to uh, take these things in and, you know, if, and put it through register, right? So we're kind of going to buffer the result, right? And so we're buffering after the operation. Uh, you see that uh, this is coming from register right there. But so the result is basically that, you know, we have this module, if it's empty, that is the full bit's not set, there's nothing else that we care about. Uh, if we give it two valid inputs, it's going to go ahead and uh, accept that, those inputs, and then turn that into, uh, populate that, put that result into register, and then mark itself as full. Uh, and it's going to mark itself as no longer ready as well, right, because it's, uh, you know, now full. And then... Um, uh, if our output is ready to receive, right, if the output's ready, then of course we mark ourselves as valid and we send it on. So it's a simple little example, but, you know, here we put some, you know, functionality into register, to our, to our module, you know, we de defined it, et cetera, et cetera. So we can go ahead and run this. Okay. 
Uh, and then if we go ahead and see what we can do with it, right? So let's say we go ahead and make some uh, instances, right? So maybe we'll make a, a couple of that, right? So we could go ahead and, you know, take a width like before, pass it on uh, to the uh, parent class. And we're going to go ahead and define our operation. Okay, we're going to do an add. Sure, right? We can do a sub. We'll do a sub. Sure. Um, so we don't have to stop there, right? We can go ahead and mix in with the factory. We use the factory pattern, right? And say, hey, what if we want to give people, you know, these couple operators, and all they had to do was give us uh, a string of the operation they want and then the width, and we'll go ahead and instantiate the right class for them, right? So... Uh, you can see the return type here I chose to use is the coupled operator. That's that abstract class, which you technically can't even instantiate, but it's okay for us to use as a type, and these are, you know, uh, subtypes of it, right? And you see, okay, yes, here we are matching based on uh, the operation and then instantiating the right class inside of it. Um, and I also added in this base case where let's say maybe I made a, a typo. It's not a bad idea if these matches, if you want to be extra sure, go ahead and throw an exception so you can't find it. Um, so maybe before we run a test, let me... I'll go ahead and print it out. It's going to be very long. It might be actually unreadable, but that at least convinces us it worked. Um, yeah, so this is going to convince us it worked. It's going to be super long, as you can see down there. Uh, but it at least convinces us it worked. Okay, so then let's go ahead and run the test case, right? So uh, if we run the test case, what am I doing? Uh, well, the test case, I'm putting some values on the inputs. And right now, I'm not trying to get too sophisticated. I'm just setting all the valids and readies to true and seeing what it does, right? So what happens? Well, uh, we're looking at the output in terms of the number and if it's uh, valid or not, right? So we see the first cycle, the output's not valid, right? Because we haven't even loaded anything into the, the coupled module yet. Then the next cycle, it loads something in. So then that cycle coming out of it, it is valid. Uh, but then there's a, a bubble, right? Then even though we're putting legitimate data, data in the front, to go back to your implementation, uh, you know, the way we have to set up is kind of that natural um, uh, bubbling here. It kind of, it's empty, so you go to full, and then you have to drain it, and then you have to fill it again, right? So it's kind of that every other, it can't go back to back. So remember, it's that, like, like that pipe parameter from our queues in our last lecture, we had to kind of deliberately tweak our logic to kind of allow us to have the ability to have a full queue into NQ and DQ into a full queue rather than having a full queue saying I can't take anything even if I am DQing the same cycle. This, this is the exact same uh, issue right here. Um, but it, it is working, right? And what's kind of cool about this, right, is I can just simply make that small change and now I'm getting subtraction, right? And the reason why the difference is one is, of course, we have these being tied to the cycle counts and, you know, one's plus one and one's not, so it's going to have a gap of one. But so you can see here what we've done is pretty cool, right? We defined, oops, let's go back a slide. We defined this abstract class. You know, it's not different from the class we've been finding so far. Uh, this is a nice part about making it abstract is you can go ahead and say, I'm not ready to define op yet. And actually, I don't want to even give you a default behavior. Um, and then uh, later on, we can go ahead and specify that, right? So we have a collection of similar things that's kind of very helpful. So cool. Any questions so far? Okay, let's get the font size back and we'll keep going. So, um, as promised, <laughs> uh, Scala has uh, this trait uh, functionality, right? And so, uh, if you even go read the Scala documentation, they're like, oh yeah, traits are great. You should probably not even need to use abstract classes. Um, like I said, for us, there's some key differences. Um, the reason why traits are cool is that you can inherit from multiple traits. So you can have, there's nothing wrong with inheriting multiple traits. Uh, like an abstract class, you can't instantiate a trait. You only can inherit from it. Um, however, the reason why we sometimes like to use abstract classes in Chisel is the ability to actually pass around constructor parameters is pretty helpful, right? Um, and uh, so that's something we kind of like. Uh, and so one of the things you often hear about traits is people refer to them as mixin or mixins. Um, so what's going on is because you can inherit from multiple things, rather than being, oh, yes, this is my parent. I'm just, just like them, but only with a small tweak. It's more like, you know what? Here's a trait. I'm just going to get a little bit of functionality from this one little thing. I'm going to kind of mix this thing into my existing class, right? Um, and so that's kind of the idea. So think of it as, you know, hey, I have this, you know, thing. And so like I said, in particular, when we're using it in Chisel, 
you may have completely different modules that are very, very different in their nature and their implementation and use. Um, but the reason why you um, use a uh, 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 trait is you maybe use something you want to add to them that makes them somehow uh, somehow shared, right? So perhaps there's some extra functionality. So um, the example I've done here is really artificial, but uh, it shows you know it actually compiling and running. Uh, so in this case, what it is is uh, I want to go ahead and inject some functionality into this module, right? So I have some module, in this case, it's a counter, and it's gonna go ahead and count stuff, right? And you know what? Uh, I want to be able to have a, you know, universal way in my project of um, interfacing and debugging with these modules. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, hey, I'm gonna have this trait where I'm gonna print something in simulation where I'm gonna mix it in to uh, my module, right? So you can see, uh, you know, you're only allowed to inherit from one thing. So in this case, we're hearing from multi-IO module, which for now you can think of as module, we'll come to that difference in just a moment. Um, and then we're mixing in a trait, which is in this case, width. So here we're mixing in a trait. You can add more uh, traits here. Remember, you only can inherit from one, you only can have inherit from one class. You can, you can have multiple traits if you would like. Um, okay, so here we're mixing in print and sim. So, um, like the abstract class, you can have some abstract fields in the traits. So we have this abstract field message, which this is chiseled. This is not Scala, right? This is saying, hey, this is in the generated hardware, conditionally print uh, this message, right? If the print enable is high. Um, and, uh, you know, what's our message? Well, we chose to say hello from this counter. And then, uh, what are we actually doing? Okay, so you know we're instantiating a counter and it's counting. That's what this module is doing. Uh, but in terms of uh, how it all kind of fits together, um, there's a few things, right? So notice how when we defined the I/O for uh, this thing, we did it a little differently. There's a little wrinkle, right? So remember we said you inherit from module, uh, you're kind of inheriting certain things, right? Uh, that's kind of the default way of defining modules. So when you inherit from module. You kind of have to call that thing I.O. and you have to do that thing in a certain way. With multi-I.O., you're not required to have a val called I.O. as part of your class, right? Um, however, uh, you are, um, uh, you do have to kind of wrap everything you want to be in I.O. as I.O., this I.O. Uh, you know, uh, object method. Um, so in this case, uh, you can see, for example, uh, well, it's not even shown, but we were to try to access it. It would be you know c dot out. It wouldn't even be c dot io dot out in order to get to this field. So likewise, uh, with this multi -IO, io module business, what we're saying is, hey, um, we're gonna go ahead and make it an, add an io, which is this print enable, which is an input. And so notice this was nowhere defined here. It's not even part of this class, right? But it got mixed into this module, right? This module now has a field called print enable, which came from this trait, and we can go ahead and poke a value into that. And so yeah, you can see the functionality, of course, you know, look at the actual behavior, it's what we expect, it's gonna say hello. Um, but that's that, right? So then, you know, so what would happen, like I said, so if this was not a multi-IO module, just a regular module, it's gonna complain, hey, where's your IO, right? Uh, Cause I don't see the IO method, uh, and that's something you need to do in order to fully instantiate this abstract thing. Um, and so yeah, so we're using multi-IO module, which you know, Free you from that constraint, and multi-IO module is usually used in this case where you are gonna have IOs injected kind of multiple places, so perhaps from a, a mix-in trait. Um, and so there you have it. Uh, this one is, you know, here we're actually adding in functionality. Uh, you could also imagine, this is a common use to look at some of the large uh, chisel projects. They often use traits, not even just for um, uh, functionality, but also for parameters where you can imagine, you know, for big designs, there's like a lot of parameters and you get tired of passing parameters around. There's so many case classes or other things. Um, you can go ahead and uh, use uh, inheritance in these mixins to kind of conveniently kind of pass these things around um, and embed things and kind of make sure it's clear. So that way you kind of know what's going on rather than have to be kind of an argument that you have to keep giving when you invoke things, uh, essentially things, instead you can actually use this kind of mixin thing. 
cool. There's a lot here, so I was, you know, uh, maybe there's questions in the pause a little longer. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, uh, multi-IO module seems to be more flexible than regular modules, so, you know, why not always use multi-IO module? I actually don't have a great answer to that. Um, so uh, I suspect, you know, this is just being pragmatic, uh, multi-IO module <laughs> is used commonly. So it's not like something that's like totally esoteric doesn't exist. But that being said, um, uh, modules I think use a lot more. And I think as a result, I bet you the code behind it's probably a lot more stable and mature. And I think a lot of other things are gonna be happier if your IOs are kind of placed inside that IO object. So not covered in this course, but there's actually a new set of functionality that's experimental. Uh, it actually provides uh, chisel style, uh, pro provides reflection for chisel. You actually can have chisel modules that can go ahead and examine themselves or even other modules nearby and see, you know, what ports they have or what certain fields are and it's kind of interesting interactions that way. Um, and so, for example, I'm not sure some of those functions are perhaps hindered by something like multi-IO module. Um, and then uh, the question from chat from the TA, which is related is, you know, wait, what about raw module? So raw module actually is the, uh, I believe it's like the, the simplest base one, right? And so you do a raw module, uh, this is interesting because you know from the outside, it's not clear, but inside look at the code, you'll figure out what the actual inheritance pattern is. A raw module doesn't even add um, uh, clock or reset. So module actually in, in addition, as an improvement over module, uh, raw module actually adds in clock and reset. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff it does for you. So hypothetically, if you were you know, tired of seeing clock and reset for all of your modules, you can go ahead and extend raw module instead and you won't have clock and reset for a purely combinational module. Normally don't worry about that because that port's not used and so you know any good cat tool is gonna prune it away. Um, so as a style point, I would say, unless you need the multiple IO functionality, uh, I think doing a regular module with a single IO is a pretty good uh, convention. Because you can imagine that it's also good for users where you know, you're in the middle of a very big, long module um, and you see IO dot on a connection somewhere, you know that's from an IO, right? Versus if it's just some random variable being connected, it may not be so obvious, right? So I bet you there may also be a style argument for why you might consider uh, using module and thus having this kind of bound IO variable to make it very clear something that's kind of global where for these tiny modules, it's trivial, right? But if you have something, you know, like a 100, 200 line module, you're in the middle of the body somewhere. It's good to know what's an IO sometimes. Um, you can see similar things in uh, software coding guidelines where, for example, uh, you know, in C++ from Google's standard uh, style guide, they say, you know, hey, if you don't uh, pass mutably by reference, right? So as I mean, if you want to pass a reference to save copying a giant object, sure, that's fine. But there better be a constant reference, meaning you're not going to change it. If you are going to, if you do want to change it, that's okay, but you need to make it a pointer. So why does that matter? Because you look inside the body of that function, uh, when you see somebody modifying something, if you see somebody modifying something that's normally, uh, you're presuming that's local. But if it's actually modifying something beyond the scope of that function, you probably want to know about that. So if you see somebody modifying something through a pointer, you know, with that arrow symbol, then now you know what's going on. So that's kind of these things that come up with conventions and style guides as you're trying to figure out common patterns, i.e. conventions, to make things more readable for people coming into things. So sometimes, as you've experienced for this course, right? I mean. Uh, you have a problem to solve, and so you reach need to solve your problem. You don't always read everything from the beginning, start to finish, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is a long rant, but I think this has been a good discussion I've had with myself as well as the injections from the uh, class about, you know, what might be a good style here. And I think, yeah, part of the reason why it'd be good to use module rather than multi-IO module when possible is from a style point of view, having your IO is labeled IO dot something makes it very clear when they're used where they're coming from. Now, we know that you, of course, could use a val and you know, make a val equal to io something and use that val elsewhere in your body. That might be an anti-pattern. Maybe it's something you shouldn't do because it might be, you know, once again, kind of obfuscating the nature of what you're doing. But I think this is a good question. Um, I'm not sure if there's other limitations IO, multi-IO module. I'll take a look and see if I'm shared down Slack afterwards. Great question. Uh, other questions? Okay. Ah, uh, well, let's, uh, keep going. So, um, we went on this long journey and remember we had this really simple problem from last time. Our problem from last time was 
we had this Q class. We had gone through our various ways of improving our Q implementation. Check, we did all that. And then we just wanted to template the type of data going into our Q. Because remember last time it was had to be a uint, and you had to and so we parameterized the width, but it still had to be a uint. Now, in many cases, people with enough casting can take whatever arbitrary type or bundle they have, turn it to a uint, and then turn it back out of a uint. Wouldn't it be nice if actually you kind of keep that type going into our thing? And so what we wanted was something where the type being worked on was self-templatable, right? So in other words, a generic type. This is often referred to in other languages, right, using generics. And so Scala has this functionality. Uh, and we're going to see some examples of that uh, in the next few slides. Um, so the reason why I covered the stuff before that until uh, the stuff in the lecture today until now, first is that's to help us understand it, right? Because uh, typically when you use this uh, functionality, you don't just use it blindly. You use something called a type bound. So what we're going to say is, hey, we want to accept some sort of type as a parameter, but it can't be any type. It has to be something that you know is a subtype of something or even a super type of something. So Scala is very flexible in that sense. And there's a whole uh, world of more functions, uh, functionality to look into with regards to if you want to handle bit types that are covariant versus contravariant. I always get this too mixed up. Um, but the type bounds I'll show you in the next few slides are the most common usage scenarios, so that'll make more sense. As another aside, if you start programming with templated types in Scala, at some point, you may see a very cryptic error message talking about something called type erasure. Um, and so I put a link here to a blog post about that. I'm going to go ahead and read about that. It's a really interesting, uh, interesting in quotes, uh, wart about Scala. I would say it's by far my least favorite part of Scala. It's not because I run this problem so often. It's more just to me where it's like, it's just an ugly part of the language. And I think the choices made were not great. So I'm going to unfortunately disagree with the uh, language creator on this one. So. To briefly summarize what the issue is, uh, this is nothing about the language. This is because it runs on top of the Scala, uh, sorry, it runs on top of the Java Virtual Machine or the JVM. The JVM version they supported originally, the older versions of Java did not have generics. And so in order to map Scala to generics, they had to do some clever stuff. And one of the issues, wait, if the underlying JVM doesn't have generics, uh, how are you going to have that information, right? So the answer is, uh, you kind of need to pass around some type information along with the things to kind of know what to do with it. And the way the generics implemented in the JVM kind of tossed that away. And so thus, um, Scala, you know, being built very tightly with this JVM in mind, uh, also tossed away its information. So if you were, it's possible to write Scala with generic types where it's going to say, hey, I can't do this because I lost this type. Its type has been erased. Um, there's a way with that blog post is going to show you to add some imports add some boilerplate, and then all of a sudden it passes around type information to solve this problem. But to me, that's extra work for the user, right? And I'm like, oh, that, that's annoying. It's confusing. Why do I need to know about this? Um, and so the defense given for why they did this was not only did they want to support this older JVM, which didn't have this functionality kind of nicely built in there, was also that you know by automatically passing around this class tag, they call it, which tells you to type, that might slow things down. Now, like I said, for the complexity involved with this, I imagine I would rather that be a default, even if it's a little bit slower. Uh, I'm trying to be generous, maybe imagine that perhaps the reason why this is not the default is even though I don't use this functionality very often, perhaps maybe deep inside the standard library it's used very commonly, in which case the default behavior was a slower thing, actually slower thing down. Maybe that's just going on, maybe that's why it's a defensible choice. But uh, yeah, this is like the, the most, uh, and, uh, you know, in uh, most, many years in computer science training, this is, like, this is easily the most odd, annoying detail I've ever come across in all my years of programming. Um, that's why I link to it, but yeah, it's a small detail and hopefully you don't come across it. Um, okay, so let's talk about doing templated types. So in Chisel, like I said, you want to use these type bounds. And so we don't want to take any old type. We want to take something that's uh, of a subtype of Chisel data. So you're like, wait a second, what the heck is Chisel data? That's the next slide. So here are the uh, type bounds, or the type hierarchy in Scala, or sorry, Chisel. So you can see, you know, oh yeah, hey, these are uint, sint, things we're familiar with. And like, what is actually behind the scenes? Uh, well, uh, you know, hey, if we make our own user types, you know, we, we can go extend bundle. We know how to do that. Um, and it's kind of interesting looking at this, right? You kind of see some interesting things maybe you didn't realize before. For example, like, hey, look, bool is just a subtype of uint, right? That's just, uh, you know, a single bit uint. Interesting. 
uh, you know, both Essent and Uint um, are inheriting from two different traits, both bits and num. Uh, and then you can kind of see this kind of plays together. So what is data? Data really is just any thing in Chisel that uh, takes, uh, you know, some sort of values, right? So we see it has Uint Essent, it has our vex, it has our bundles. We haven't talked a lot about reset or async reset because it's kind of just been working for us right now. Um, there's also a fixed point type built natively in the chisel, it's not just a library. Uh, we didn't cover that at all in this course, but it exists if you need that kind of DSP kind of math. Um, so cool. So yeah, so we're saying data, really just anything in chisel that's like an actual hardware chisel type, that's fine. If this was a Scala int, this is going to break stuff. We want to kind of recognize that. But hey, we're saying, hey, give me anything that's a data. Um, and we'll deal with that. OK, so I have a question from chat. I'm going to go forward a slide. They're saying, hey, wait a second. In this type hierarchy, uh, I don't see reg and wire. Uh, correct. You also don't see module. So uh, this is that kind of distinction. This is kind of why I did that rationale about is it reg of vec or vec of reg? And remember, the answer is reg of vec. Um, the reason why is that these are types. So if essence is a type, you can't, you know, touch an essence, right? It's more you have an instance of an essence, right? Um, so it's a type you know, describing some properties, right? Versus something like a wire or a reg is like an actual object in the sense of like, this is a instantiated piece of hardware, right? So I can have a wire, which it could be a single wire, you know, a bunch of wires together. And that's going to be something in the hardware design that gets generated. But that wire has a type kind of associated with it, right? And so there's kind of difference between like the actual, you know, physical thing versus like the type it represents. And so types are really kind of more defining, you know, what it represents, how do we interpret it, how do we interact with it, as opposed to what is the actual thing versus a reg, you know, is yes, this is a sequential element to hold data, you know, a wire. Yes, this is a asynchronous thing to transmit data, right? So it's kind of like those things. And so with that reasoning in mind, that's why you want to put reg of vec rather than vec of reg. Because I was, in my head, you still always think of vec as like a mux, but no. Think of it as a type. Think of it as just a type that just happens to have predefined numbered names for things. And reg, yes, you actually want to register for reg. So that's what's going on with that. So yeah, that was a really good question about why, why is there no module in this diagram. Um, but yeah, uh, cool. So let's talk more about this, right? So uh, here's a templated type example. And so uh, in Scala, this is not just for chisel, you give the templates uh, parameters in these square brackets. You remember a couple lectures ago when I showed you like the API for map on seek, we saw the same functionality, right? We had, in this case, it was completely general, right? You know, it has like, it was this A. There wasn't even type bounds on it because it was fine to be anything. In this case, we're saying, hey, I want to type T that's actually, you know, of some form of data. It could be a subtype, that's fine, but I don't want something that's not a chisel data. Um, and what do we do? Well, here we're just doing a pass through. Okay, so we said we want inputs and outputs of that type. Now here's where it gets a little different in Chisel versus Scala. Notice how, uh, what am I passing? I'm not passing a type T, I'm passing this thing gen, right? So this is a, a convention, this name gen. But uh, what we're saying is, remember we often, when we do things like this, we actually want to kind of pass around this constructor, right? And so um, the fact that it's a type T, this is information that the compiler is going to infer, you know, and it's do good stuff with, and needs to know what this type is. However, uh, what we really want is a way to uh, actually have the object to kind of populate into an input and or, or into an output or whatever else we're using it, right? So that's what's going on here. So in terms of what this actually did, right? I mean, this isn't too crazy, right? Comparing this to some other module, you know, really all we had to add was basically this, these square brackets and then explicitly give the, the type again, this gen. And then when we want to use it, we just say, hey, give me uh, a gen. So yeah, you know, if we want to do uh, a pass through with an essent, um, since we're not changing it, that's easy, right? So it's not gonna look any different for essent versus uint, right? Um, but yeah, we can go ahead and, you know, if we wanted to change this to uh, a bool, oops, uh, forgot the, there we go. Uh, no problem, right? So, um, this is a uh, generic and yeah, we, we templated that. And so I said, the reason why we covered the generics later was we want to talk about the fact that, you know, sometimes you want to constrain the types of these type bounds. So you can have really complicated uh, stuff in Scala. You can say, I want something to say subtype of something. You can also say, hey, it better be a super type of something else. <laughs> That's also possible. 
Uh, you can say, and then you may also see plus or minus. Uh, and that's the covariate, contravariant type stuff, which I don't want to cover at all. Um, but for us, this will get you covered 90% of the time, right? This will be fine. And if you go look inside the implementations of the Chisel Util libraries, you'll see this most of the time. If you don't see this, it's because either do some sort of weird legacy thing or some other weird trick going on. But this is going to help you most time to, to be generic. Cool. Uh, questions on this example so far? Yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. So the question was, yeah, wait, so this type balance, that's just a good practice, is that necessary? That is necessary, right? Um, because, yes, if I don't give it this type bound, uh, Scala is going to say, hey, I'm assuming any arbitrary type can come in here. If I'm assuming any arbitrary type can come in here, I can basically make almost no assumptions about what functionality that type supports, right? So uh, in particular, right, you know, um, momentarily ignoring the I.O. because, of course, if we pass in into the I.O. to make the I.O. Uh, yeah, blow up. Um, if you want to do anything with that type, in order to have the functionality you're expecting, it needs to be possible, right? So, for example, let's say I tried to, to add two T's together, right? I had, you know, some, you know, val X, which was uh, a T, and, you know, uh, you know, say it was equal to four or whatever. Well, I, mean, I don't want to give it a concrete value, but, for example, let's say I want to do something like adding two T's together. Uh, even having the add operator is an assumption about what that um, thing supports, right? Uh, and so, for example, uh, yeah, these type bounds aren't just like helpful, but they're usually necessary because you're probably going to do something with that thing of that type in order to kind of, you know, convince the compiler that yes, that thing you want to do with it is actually available. You need to make sure it's kind of commensurate, right? So uh, the thing we want to do is we want to pass that type as an argument to these input and output helper methods, as well as, uh, you know, it's going to, you know, be used, the result that's also gonna be affecting here, right? So for that to all work out, it needs to be a chisel data. So inside the chisel internals, they're using a chisel data as the types, right? So yeah, if I remove this, we're gonna get an error, but maybe we'll go ahead and do it so we can just see it, right? So we can see that, for example, uh, this input method, it itself is templated, right? <laughs> Uh, and hey, they say, you need to give me a type that's of type chisel data. If you don't give me something that's of type chisel data, we got a problem. Now, you know, here we chose to do chisel data. What if we wanted to be more specific, right? Oops, sorry, go forward. So instead of data, what if we said, hey, what if we restrict ourselves to just uh, element? Uh, that should be okay. Yeah, that's fine. So now if I tried to pass through, uh, you know, something else like uh, a vec, it's going to yell at me, right? Um, so, for example, if I made this like a vec of two uints of uh, eight, it's going to say, hey, wait, no, 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 you said it had to be an element, and I don't conform to those type bounds, right? Because I put a limit on a type, uh, it's not going to work. If I relax it back to data where vec is, you know, it works just fine. Hey, look, hey, it did the right thing where, look, I only did one thing here. I didn't use the word vec anywhere, but I used the word vec here and went ahead and made multiple instances there like that. So yeah, uh, this is us doing that generic, right? So you can see the generics are really helpful for us kind of building uh, generators that are very parameterized to some kind of user situation. Um, so, uh, Here's our thing from last lecture. And I've made the small changes and they're, they're really emphasize they're really quite small uh, in order to just uh, get it to do gener uh, parameterized, right? So we chose a type of type data. We're okay if they're giving a wide thing, that's fine. Uh, so we actually make them pass in a type now as an argument, like before us in that gen pattern. Uh, here we are using gen to define our interfaces. And then we also use gen to define uh, the memory uh, where element type, right? And otherwise, it's the exact same code as before, right? So that code is that progressively, uh, you know, agilely uh, kind of updating, right? We got, you know, a single entry thing working on fixed size uints, variable size uints. Then we got better at multi-entry. We got a lot better doing multi-entry more efficiently, handling all sorts of kind of cases and corner cases better and better and better. And now here we are even parameterizing the type we're working on. So it's not just uints, it's anything that kind of fits there. 
Well, that's it. So that's, that's really all it kind of took to kind of get that functionality. And I believe that completed. Let's go ahead and use you not to be sure. Yep, so it did. Great. And so here's the, the stuff from last time for the testing. And yeah, we can go ahead and run it. So yeah, here we made a uint8. Um, and it worked just fine. You know, I can go ahead and make this an essent. And because I factor things this way, kind of have to pass things around. I probably shouldn't make it a dot u in the test case. So yeah, this is more limitation on my test case not being fully parameterized, less so than the module. And yeah, it's still going to uh, be happy. Um, so yeah, so that's an example of templating. We'll go back to the actual uh, module body, which is probably more interesting. So yeah, as you can see there, we've now gone on this journey. We're now, after all of this, what have we gained, right? We've gained the ability to use abstract classes if we want to perhaps define some things, leave other things abstract, and go ahead and concretely implement them. We've talked about how to use traits to kind of mix things into existing modules. And we've also talked about how to do these generics, where you kind of can template types uh, to kind of build even more flexible generators. Um, so there we have it. That's kind of the, you know, one lecture's worth of summaries of inheritance uh, for this course. Uh, great. Uh, any closing questions? Well, okay, uh, that's all folks. Uh, have a good one. I, the homework, uh, sorry, the homework's already posted. The new lab we posted tomorrow. And yeah, we're moving along great. Only another week or two more of homeworks and labs and then we're gonna shift gears to projects. I'll be giving a little bit more detail on the projects on uh, Friday or next lecture. All right, have a good one.